Hello, fellows from Circulo Lovecraftiano y Horror. Welcome to a new edition from the Mouth of the Madman Live. Today is our pleasure to have with us a great author, and the honor is bigger because she's a lady in a world that is traditionally been dominated by men. We are talking about the talented Sarah Langan, writer of four novels, The Keeper, The Missing, Audrey's Door, and coming out next year, uh, Good Neighbors. She also written many short stories that sail on the supernatural, dark fantasy, and even sci-fi. Winner of three Bram Stokers Award and member of the board of the Shirley Jackson Award. She has a master's in cre creative writing from Columbia University and also a master's in environmental health, and science and toxicology from New York University. So without further ado, we welcome Sara. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to meet you. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. Okay. Well, we can start um, asking you if this is your first session with Latin American followers. Yeah, yeah, this is kind of exciting for me, so. So you live uh, for a while in New York City. Uh, over there, have you been in touch with the Latin American community in some way? Uh, no, I mean, I grew up on Long Island and then, um, no, I, I, I wish that I had, but uh, I wasn't exposed to much of the Latin American community. I lived near Columbia for a while in Harlem, and then I lived in Crown Heights with my family. We raised our kids there. Um, and we moved out from Crown Heights four years ago to Los Angeles uh, because my husband traveled probably like one week out of every month uh, to LA because he does film. And we kind of realized that to keep the family together, we'd be happier if we all moved to Los Angeles. We, we really miss New York though. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and now that you live in LA and it's, well, uh, closer to Mexico border. Have you ever visited Mexico? Yeah, yeah. We went to Oaxaca um, last year for New Year's Eve and the week before that, and it was it was great. We we spent the whole week in the downtown, but we made little trips to the ruins, and we learned how to make tortillas, which is really fun. Nice. Yeah. yeah, and we like I ate like some kind of like a cricket is it crickets or worms yeah. like, they told them out there, like you eat it and it was I was at a big table with a bunch of people and I was like all right and I thought everyone would and then they just did it to me <laughs> and they were like no one else is to eat it <laughs> but, so <laughs> and and your family didn't try them uh my husband was like <laughs> I have to know but my daughters were like there's just not a chance in hell. So <laughs> if you hear drilling, it's because my husband has decided during COVID to erect a picket fence and he's sawing the wood and nailing it. So I had everything closed and I retreated to our bedroom in a corner. But I don't know, you might hear sawing and it's because my husband is like, I'm going to spend the weekend making a, a picket fence. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. Uh, and what do you think of Oaxaca? Do you think that it was like a magical place or did you enjoy it? Oh, I loved it. It was great. I mean, you know, the our favorite day, I think we we went out of the city to this small town and then we went to somebody's farm and they taught us we we did it outside their house. They taught us how to make like a traditional meal and we drank all different kinds of mezcal which was really fun um and then there was this giant ditch with some wild dogs in it and we went with this other family and our two daughters and their two sons were like a ditch and wild dogs and they like we watched the sunset while our kids ran in a ditch with wild dogs it was super fun like i couldn't have imagined a more fun time and everyone was very friendly um and i think i i was raised catholic so i think there's sort of a connection that I feel whenever I'm in a place that's predominantly Catholic. 
Nice. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Yesterday we have a meeting on our circle and we discuss um, three of your stories. One is called Afterlife, Afterlife. The other is Hindsight, and the last one was um, Sacred Cows. Oh wow! Yes, maybe. I mean, they're from a while ago, right? I think 2010, 2013. Yeah, yeah. But, I think mm -hmm. it's probably. Yeah, I don't know which one. Sacred Cows of those might be my favorite. I think it's the most fully realized of those okay. stories. And I think it's because I wrote it and then I was like, I can't make any sense of why any of this is happening. And I put it away. And then like a year later, John Joseph Adams was like, do you have a story for me for a nightmare? And I was like, let me look at this. And I looked at it and I realized what the ending was that that specific ending. Um, which I think without that specific ending, that story doesn't pan out. So um, I think that was the story that had the most time to percolate is what I'm saying. I liked Afterlife a lot because the writing is funny and weird, but I don't know, what did you guys like? Well, it was actually a comment of Afterlife that, that it was funny. I mean, we really enjoyed that one. I think it was the, mo the most liked one in the night and um, we were coming up with different theories like um, if she's just uh, delusional and only uh, the ghosts are only in her head if the ghosts are real if if she's a ghost also because of what happened in her childhood so it was a very interesting story to discuss I don't know if you guys want to ask something uh, uh, also, I, I I think that this um, this uh, short story of yours is uh, somewhat in, in some way related with the the the, the fiction the um, uh, of some uh, writers like Harlan Ellison maybe on the 70s because it's um, very interesting. Um, uh, narrative techniques uh, that you are experimenting here and and I personally I found uh, interesting to see some kind of uh, influence of the Nobel Bash movement maybe I, I am wrong in with this lecture with this interpretation excuse me but uh, I don't know uh, there is some uh, influence on, in your works of this movement I, you know, I think it's probably, uh, I read a lot of the horror. I haven't read much Harlan Ellison, uh, but, you know, I've read a lot of horror from that era. And I, and I think it kind of naturally infuses with what I'm doing. I think it's kind of hard to avoid um, influences of the past and responding to the past and sort of like, that's kind of the function of, of, of narrative, I think, for a writer is to, is to read and to fall in love with the other stories we've read and to think, well, what, what's my take on this though? I would probably say my biggest influence is Kelly Link um, because I'd never, I'd only read horror that really took itself seriously before then. And, uh, and it was by men, um, so their perspective it's often similar, but it's not quite uh, as resonant. And then I read Kelly Link and I was blown away because she was so funny and she was saying things that like I was feeling in my life as opposed to like some kind of nostalgia for the 1950s or like being sad you didn't get the woman you wanted or you know those stories that are cool because you, they're propul propulsive plot-wise, as opposed to something that just really hit my personal reality. And she has this great tone of like quirky, smart, confused girl. And uh, so anyway, when I read that, my fiction completely changed. I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before. I think, you know, in 50 years, people are gonna look back and think that Stranger Things Happen was a benchmark in literature that no one can currently see. 
And um, talking about uh, influence, I I believe also that there is an influence of um, uh, Joyce Carol Oates' uh, short stories in your in your work, but also there is some um, likeness, some kind of um, humor point of view that um, uh, it reminds me uh, some of Kurt Vonnegut, some kind of a uh, sense of uh, absurdity, absurdity in in the in, 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 I don't know in the universe in the in the in the shape of things because uh, uh, there is some horror in your stories but also there is some uh, sense of disbelief I, 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 a very strange uh, sensation of being there to touch the things that you are uh, telling us but also to be uh, in a, some kind of um, uh, pop, puppet theater. I, I don't know if it's uh, some kind of uh, scenography of a terror representation. Like hereditary. Like hereditary, the, hereditary. the, 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 the movie. Yes. So what I, movie? Ah, like the hereditary <laughs> from Ari. Her her hereditary. <gasps> that is such a great movie i actually um so we were talking before before the you you started recording about um how many books have i written and i spent five years writing a book and my agent sent it to like every day and my agent sent it to all the big publishers it was rejected and we decided to pull it instead of going to smaller press and i'll you know it'll come out at some other point but I remember not understanding why the big publishers were so upset by it, you know, and it's and it's kind of the roughly the plot is the same as weirdly I didn't know Stephen King was writing the Institute because I set this thing out before his book was published but it's the same plot it's like bad company steals some supernatural kids and then it like sucks their spinal fluid like crazy stuff like that. And I'm like, QAnon also, I'm glad it's not published because I would have been supporting QAnon, but no idea. Anyway, I couldn't figure out why all the editors were like, you kill dogs, you kill kids, like this is insane and it's weird. And, and I was like, they're, they're pansies. And then I watched Hereditary and I was like, I love this movie so much, but of course it's too dark, you know, like, <laughs> like it would have to be a small press that publishes. Like, I don't know how he got hereditary and how it was, I loved hereditary, but it's so dark. And you start to get angry at the end, I think. You're like, this isn't, I didn't, I didn't pay $20 to watch this. You know, I thought there was something happy was gonna happen. There was gonna be at least one character who had some kind of insight before they all died, you know, and no. And <laughs> so I get it. Like I, it was the first time watching Hereditary that I finally understood why some people get so pissed off <laughs> at my stuff. <laughs> I love that. I loved Hereditary. But uh, your question about Vonnegut, I love Vonnegut. I love him so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like everything is a do, I do is a conversation with what I love. So Vonnegut, King, Oates, Atwood, Kelly Link. Um, and then just, you know, it's, it feels it, Marquez, all that stuff. Like I, I, I would wish one day I could be half as good as these guys, but that's what I'm shooting for. And that's all I think about. And when I read their stuff, I'm like, why did you do that? Why did this, why, why was this decision made? And, and, you know, it's sort of a love and it's a hate and it's, it's, you know, it's what passion is, I guess. Have you considered, uh, because with, with some of the authors of your generation that we, will, that we have been talking lately, uh, especially Lang, your, your, your cousin, <laughs> John Langan, uh, Paul Tremblay, uh, we, we've been discussing this subject that there is a sad horror, sad horror genre. Uh, so maybe, maybe you write sad horror in, at the end of the day, because ugly things are happening to relatively nice people. Like in the uh, Audrey's door, we can see she's she's been put all through these bad things happening to her, 
and then she's she's not evil, but she ends up a little mess a little bit messed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I. Uh... I think, you know, it depends on where you are in your life. Like my first story that I published was called Grief and it was about a couple and their baby dies and then they're sad. And like the mom has an affair and the, and the husband knows, but then they get over it and they throw the kids clothes away. So I would never write that story now. That's the saddest story. Like and I wouldn't want to like, and you can always imagine dead kids when you don't have kids, but like, I, I would feel so superstitious to write about something like that. I wouldn't, it wouldn't do it, you know? So there was a like, and the keeper, oh my God, I would not write that now. And I'm so glad I wrote it then because it's like a fiery, passionate 20 something who like just wants to set the earth on fire, you know, and scorch it down. And now I'm like, well, you know, we kind of want it for future generations, right? That would be good. Um, so I think there's there's like sort of a an arc, you know, in, in a writer's career of where they are and what they're responding to and and uh, their point of view. That I think it's is really specific to writers because you can see what they're interested in according to uh, what their life is. You know, the the ones who are in academia write about academia, and the ones who are Raising kids kind of write about families and the ones who are, there's a lot of doctors, they write about, you know, medical thrillers. Um, I'm trying not to write so many sad things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, and also you, you, now that you mentioned medical issues, you also talk about um, mental illness a lot. And yeah what's what's your take on that i mean how can you represent something that you haven't lived i hope or maybe you are close to someone who's suffered that or how do you manage to write something so realistic well um my mom she recently died but she had uh schizophrenia and i think um growing up we were never allowed to talk about it you know, it was the 80s and the 90s, and there was this incredible stigma attached to schizophrenia. So I, I kind of wonder if that's the root of some of my horror, because I was raised by this lovely, lovely woman um, for whom reality wasn't that firm line that other people may have had, been, you know, if they were raised by parents who did not have schizophrenia. Um, so... I kind of, and I would wonder, like I would, you know, I kept counting the years and the months, like when's it gonna come out in me? When's it, because it's hereditary. So I think, um, you know, I think I'm kind of obsessed with mental illness. Um, I like, what causes it? Why does it happen? You know, there's some people think that it's caused by the toxinoplasmosis that cats carry. Like there's a higher incidence of people with viral infections or you know, it could possibly be autoimmune, but then it's also caused by like violence in childhood. And there's, there's so many interesting things and it wreaks real havoc on, a, on everyone around the person who has mental illness and the person and the person themselves. It's like, a, it's a really painful disease. So, you know, I think about it um, and I, I look for it and, and because I've, I know what it is, I kind of can, I'm always seeing it in other people. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's something that I will always, I will, I will always be writing about. Um, as for like, you know, I don't, I've been really lucky in that I've never been mentally ill myself. Um, and I've never, you know, after I had babies, I was like, you know, off for about a year or two. And like, I couldn't, you know, I had to like, I, you know, was only sleeping five hours a night and I decided I had to read every New Yorker and Atlantic when they came out and then I had to work and I had to do this. And I think that was probably postpartum anxiety or depression or something, but it wasn't, it was completely functional. Um, 
so super lucky, but I, I think I think I can imagine pretty well into mental illness because of what I saw growing up, um, but not totally. I mean, I don't totally know. And, you know, like I was like everybody else um, until recently and someone was sad and I'd be like, you should cheer up and exercise more, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, that's the wrong thing. Don't say that. You know, it's, it's, it's all a learning process. And I guess you were asking about writing what you don't know. Um, that's, it's a really good question. And like, I feel like it's a writer's job to try and imagine someone else's life. And we're really failing if we're unable to do that. And I think there's a real wave right now that we're only supposed to tell our own stories and only supposed to tell our own lives. And that's valid in the way that um, where we tell other people's stories, those people are silenced. That should stop. Um, where we're, you know, if I'm going to tell a story about an African-American woman, you know, in slave slavery, uh, and then some African-American woman who tells that story doesn't get her book published, that's wrong. She, you know, that's not the right, I get that. But I do, I do feel like it's our job um, to, to imagine other people's lives. And if we need to do tons more research, if we need to talk to tons more people, if we need to be living in the world more, then we should. And that's when I read a young writer's you know, short story, I don't know if you've had this experience, we'll send it to you and it's like, you don't know what a job is. You keep saying they went to the job, you know, then they need to go work in a job. And it's, it's the same thing. Um, if that makes any sense. Oh, That's, and I have tried. I'm sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. I see Mezcal and yes, I love Mezcal. It's so good. I love it. We came back with two bottles. Two bottles we have an agave it? plant That's out funny, front. Right? I'm sorry, and my husband wants to chop down the agave plant so that he can make pulque. <laughs> oh, and there's um, there's a pulque place in downtown LA that we went to during COVID. He was like, I just have to try this pulque. I have to, <laughs> Which, and it was good. You like it? You like yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Because some people, uh, you know, it's a little bit slimy. The texture is, is very thick. So there's people who really don't like pulque, but it's amazing. I mean, especially if you drink it in Mexico. Yes, that was, it was really fun in the, in the, in the markets, having a little pulque. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about generations a little bit ago and uh, I was reading the Audrey's Door and there is this bit Uh, almost at the end of the book where she uh, she's reading the newspaper and there is like a, like a bit written by a journalist where, where he said that this generation has inherited an enormous debt and it will not survive but then she thinks that every generation faces its own extinction and it feels like the end of the world and despite all the problems every generation gets to manage, gets, gets to survive. Uh, so now we are, we are older, obviously, than the kids, but what do you think about the, the generation that is inheriting this COVID and stuff, especially with your daughters, especially when we, when we were talking about the people who have kids, uh, will they be able to manage all these problems that, that they are facing, this real life horror? I You know, my husband and I were talking about this last night um, because we we're listening to this podcast about the ends of civilizations. That's really good. It's British. The first one is like ancient Sumeria, and, and then we're listening to the the Roman Empire in Britain. Um, but almost every time um, it happens that these civil civilizations fall, it's because of environmental disaster and scarcity and then raiders coming in and uh, burning up all the culture. 
you know, the art, the, the literature, like ancient Samaria was one of, was the most advanced culture and, and uh, people don't know what the language is anymore. Um, it's interesting. So he thinks that they're gonna figure it out, that we're gonna figure it out. I don't, um, <laughs> like I, I don't. Uh, I think that uh, we're putting an enormous and unfair burden on our children we're saying things like it's up to you when we're we're the ones in our prime. It's up to us. Um, and uh, I would love for us to be the first society that doesn't collapse because of environment. Um, we would be the first, uh, you know, and I don't think it's the end of the world. You know, I don't think it's the end of humanity, but I think, and you know, maybe, in my in my fantasy, the collapse will come, and 400 years from then, people will won't have destroyed all the culture and the records and the science, and a consensus will form, and people will say, "Well, let's not do that again. You know, let's let's build it in a different way. You know, it would be really nice if we learn. We haven't yet. I mean, every time, it's it's because of environmental collapse. So I would love it. I would love it to be different this time. Uh, is, I just, this, is this part of the reason why you, why you uh, after studying arts, literature, and then you went to, to the, let's say the uh, science, science side to get a master on, on matters that, you know, get you ready for something like this? Or you can share something like, like that? It is, some of it is, yes. Um, the other part of it is that like I was, I had written The Keeper, but I couldn't publish it. I wasn't making any headway in writing. And I didn't like the, the job that I had. I didn't want to be in publishing. I wanted to, to be in something that I felt like I was learning all the time. Um, and at the same time, I worked on Wall Street when the, when the towers were hit. Um, and I went back to work really early and there was a lot of dust and I'm super allergic. So I got pretty sick from the World Trade Center. Um, and so I was kind of pissed off and it's my personality to be like, well, it got me, I'm gonna get it. So I'm gonna find out everything I can about it. So I went to the masters in environmental health toxicology specifically, specifically to find out what had happened to me. Um, and, and what I could do to fix it. Um, so, and then it just wound up being really a great thing. Um, it's a really good program. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm curious about like this book that's coming out in February uh, that I wrote is, is a lot about the environment and, and sort of the burden we've put on our children and like the sinkhole shows up. And what's crazy to me is there's just like sinkholes showing up all over the world. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. And there is a scientific reason and it is global warming. Um, the most interesting thing that happened, I took this class called Thermodynamics of Global Warming. And it was like super hard and like, it was thermodynamics. And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll do that. I'm an English major. Like this, sounds amazing. And like <laughs> to do my homework, I used to have to drive to the lab and hang and be like, so TAs, how do I do this? <laughs> and they'd be like, Sarah's here again. <laughs> so, but it was great and I loved it. Um, but I remember on the last day, we'd just proven beyond any doubt that it was not only happening, that, but probably irreversible and clear. And I remember raising my hand to the teacher and the teacher went to MIT and then Harvard and was this, was a new his business. And I was like, so is it irreversible? Is this, is there anything we can do about this? And he was like, oh, I don't know. Like, like the whole point, like we're only on proving it and getting the world to believe it's happening. Um, it's crazy, but I, I mean, it's not going to happen in our generations and probably our kids' generations. Yeah, but it's, it is coming <laughs> slowly at us. 
Well, yeah, yeah, the one of the stories we we talked about yesterday and I personally love was Hinsight. And and in there you talk about that, like um, this um, singularity that appears near the earth and starts uh, drawing at the earth and the earth start losing gravity and stuff like that. And how a lot of things were happening already in the earth and we were still going to die, even if that singularity didn't happen, actually, because you would talk about uh, Santo Saint Monica. Um, a reference to... Yeah, which is a reference to Monsanto, I guess. Um, oh, of yeah, the, of yeah. the corn being uh, genetically modified and stuff like that. So it was very interesting also you were talking about um, genetic disease showing more often in newborns and stuff like that, you know, like we can only assume it's going to happen when uh, contamin well, pollution gets higher and stuff like that. Well, I so, mean, so the, the, like the good things we've done is we've removed diesel from trucks. There's no lead in the dirt. You know, I actually, I, in America we have, I don't know, is it, not yet. <laughs> no, we still. Not, you not still have really diesel. Much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, aerosol, though. Globally, we got rid of aerosol, um, and that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. the, the standard of living and quality of life of every human now is better than it has ever been, and I do think humans are more important, like because I'm a human, than every other species. I'm not really concerned about. You know, I love elephants. I think they do have souls. I still think humans are more important. Um, and I think there, there are, you know, my husband is like, would be like, she's insane. Like, we're gonna figure this out. Science is gonna solve it. Everything's gonna be okay. Um, and we have solved some problems. We know cigarettes cause cancer now, you know? <laughs> they are not as good as, uh mother's milk and stuff, you know, as they thought in the 50s. Yeah. <laughs> I miss but, them so much. Like, <laughs> actually, I, I, I told my husband, I'm like, when I'm 90, I'm lighting up. Like, I'm just going <laughs> to smoke Lucky Strikes all the time. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about it because you mentioned in, in, in several of your stories, you always go to Winston's, 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 Winston's. Was that? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, that's really funny because I never smoked Winston's. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's a guy's name or I don't know. Interesting. Well, there's a story, I think, in Audrey's door. You do mention Lucky Strike. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's funny because you mentioned uh, uh, in Audrey's door, too, uh, that this guy smell, smells like Winston's. Uh, which, which I guess it turns to be, I, I was a smoker for many years too. And uh, now that somebody smokes nearby, like my father, I, I feel like you smell a lot to, to cigarettes. So, so I guess it's, it's a good point. But I was thinking like, maybe Sarah Langan has a sponsorship from Winston's or something. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm taking cigarette money. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if Ernesto, do you want to ask something? Yes, how are you doing, Sara? Hi, thanks to meet you, Ernesto. Uh, I want to uh, ask you about uh, the, um, the horror movies that you like and why. And this is because um, um, a lot of your work that I read it has a lot of influence from literature, but also from movies. That's what I think is my opinion. I saw a lot of 80s and 70s movies and 90s movies in there, and I like it a lot. And I wanted to ask you, what, what kind of uh, movies are your favorite in science fiction and in horror? Um, I love movies. Uh, I love genre movies more than all other movies. Um, and Alien, probably my one of my favorites the ring i love that movie like i had to i had to watch it like four times i kept going back to see it in the theater by myself because i was like i have to get over this fear 
I have to face the fear. <laughs> I love that movie. Um, let's see. Rosemary's Baby's fantastic and it's funny. Um, really funny. Uh, and I, I do like, I like horror movies that you can laugh during, but they're not postmodern. They're not making fun of themselves. Like I don't like uh, horror movies that are um, afraid to be scary um, or afraid to try because it's hard. Um, but I do like tension breaking laughs because I think that feels so much more real. Um, so Rosemary's Baby, The Shining, that did that same thing. Um, let's see, uh, Hereditary. I mean, that's an incredible one. Um, Get Out, I, I'm not sure, it's like a horror and a comedy together. Um, and I, I loved it. Um, Us, I didn't like as much, uh, but it's still good. Um, let's see. Uh, How about science fiction? 2001. Yeah. Um, I keep watching that. And when I was a kid, I couldn't sit through it. And I don't know what changed because it's like still you would think kind of boring. It's like two minutes of the guy or the stewardess walking on the gravity thing. And it's just mesmerizing. Um, I think it's interesting. It, it, it's like, what is God, you know, or what is life? I, I, I think movies that ask those questions are great. Um, let's see. Um, I like Westerns too. Like High Noon's a great movie. I had the kids watch it and I, I forgot that it was, you know, actually in real time. It's gotta be, you know, like 86 minutes or something. Um, that was a great stunt. Um, I've heard that Stagecoach is the, uh, was sort of the, the birth of, of archetype characters. And that makes sense to me. Um, and I, and I still liked it. Like it didn't, you know, usually movies that have been imitated a thousand different ways, by the time you see the original movie, you've seen it before and you think it's kind of stupid, you know, you've already been there, but Stagecoach wasn't, you know, I think Stagecoach really broke the mold and made the mold for, uh, for different kinds of characters that lasted, you know, through the seventies and eighties. Um, and then campy movies, you know, like any horror movie, name it. And I'll be like, that was great. I loved it. You know, <laughs> um, Aliens was fantastic. I would not call it horror, but I love every alien movie or anything Sigourney Weaver is a badass in. Um, I love the TV show, the new Battlestar Galactica from like 10 years ago. That was so fun. Like that was crazy fun. And I remember, I don't know if you guys have this, but it was on billboards everywhere, like the super hot Cylon. And so I wouldn't watch it. I was like, I think this is for sexy, you know, or under sex nerds. Like, I don't know what. And then I saw it and was like, this is the best pilot I've ever seen. They're going to blow up the last spaceship, the Battlestar Galactica. And then humanity's gone. Like, and I was just, I couldn't my daughter Clementine had just been born and I would be like up at three in the morning in closed captions, like watching it. My husband would come in and I'd be nursing her and I'd be like, I'm watching Battlestar Galactica right now. Um, it was so good. Uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love it. You know what? I guess I take it back because I apparently I do like things that are like, don't want to be scary, but are funny because love it. Um, so many movies. I, I love them all. Kubrick, I think, is, uh, I love Kubrick and I love Scorsese and I love everything they do. And Karen Kusama, um, that movie, The Invitation. I don't know if, you, if anybody's seen that, but yeah. that's my neighborhood. That's Laurel Canyon. And it was before we moved there. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of spot on about the passive aggression of of people in Los Angeles because they all work for one there's like one employer and it's the movie industry so you can never offend anyone for any reason because it'll it'll bite you so everyone's just always smiling and saying they're great and then a lot of them are high 
Like, <laughs> did that answer any of the que any of the questions? <laughs> yes, you know, I love the aliens movie, all of them. And yesterday I was with Paulo. Mira ven Paulo, dígale. This is Paulo. Hi, Pablo. And we were watching uh, Aliens, the second one, because it's my favorite. And he was like, he never saw it before. So we, we were just enjoying ourselves. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> there is a movie recently, uh, it's, it's from LA too, and I find simil similitudes between that movie and Audrey's Door, because there is this girl, it, the name is One B R. And it's this girl who is allowed to move into a residential area in Los Angeles where they are very close, neat, and all this kind of stuff. But then there's horror going on in the, in, in the background, like crazy bunch of people, like in Audrey's door, you know, like all this neighborhood, uh, all these neighbors in the complex, they have a, a, an end of uh, evil kind, just like in, in Audrey's door. And I oh, thought really? like, uh, well, you can say history repeats like uh, nothing is original anymore, blah, 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 all those things. But uh, have you have you ever caught some movies or something like, hey, that's my plot. That's what I, re <laughs> they, 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 they are inspiring or taking, you know, uh, borrowing my story. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the reverse of that, which is when I came out with Audrey Stewart, like, you know, you want to know how people are going to respond to your thing. So I had a Google alerts and I was like, and the first thing that happened was some guy was like, she stole everything from the Sentinel. And I was like, <laughs> and I had never seen the Sentinel before. So and then it kept popping up like every day. Like, I don't know, we kept reposting it all the time. So I finally watched the Sentinel and uh, it's about a woman who moves to a Brooklyn apartment and it's the gateway to hell and it's a door and she's supposed to protect it as the sentinel. It is the same story, you know? And I was like, shit, you know, like, <laughs> so I really, after that happened, I was like one, maybe I saw this when I was four, like maybe I did, but I wrote a story that's mine Two, Anytime someone comes to me and says like, this person stole your plot, I'll be like, God bless them, you know? Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll see something that's really close to what I wrote and I know that person read it or even I know that person, yes, I'll know that person read it and then they publish something that's really similar or has the same plot or has the same dynamic. And it's like, I think that's what writing in a community is about. And I think you support that. You know, you say, great, you did it this way. I might've done it a little differently or I'm glad you had success with that because I tried that version and I didn't have success with it. What did you do that was different? Who did you go to? You know, I, I don't, I think being proprietary about ideas unless it's actual theft um, is counterproductive and harmful to you because you can't do anything. Like, people are always gonna take your ideas and you're always gonna take other people's ideas. Like this doesn't, this is just in the ether. Um, you just have to figure out how to make it work for you. And um, yeah, I have, I, I really have no problem with it unless it were actual theft, like line stolen or someone was like, I heard that book she's writing is coming out in six months. I'm gonna publish mine and have my publisher do it in three months with the same plot. That's upsetting, you know? But, you know, I think, I think we're colleagues here. And um, yeah, I, I think the best way to look at it is to say, good luck and let's be friends and let's help each other out. Um, good. Well, what an in interesting story that about the movies, <laughs> The Sentinel. And well, that, he, lives, he lives right near us too. My husband met him and was like, he wrote uh, The Sentinel. <laughs> He told you. Uh, and he's like, my wife wrote this book called Audrey's Door. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, let's go with Mariana's question, and then I have another one. Okay. Uh, well, I have three questions. The first of it, it's is um, 
What were your first horror histories uh, that you have read when you were a kid? The, the second one is what uh, tales uh, do you, or histories uh, do you read to your kids or your, your daughters? Yes. I mean, it doesn't matter if it is not horror. It's just to know uh, for kids. And the third one, if uh, any director could um, direct one of your novels of or church uh, stories, uh, what uh, director uh, will you choose? Um, I'll go backwards and I'll say uh, director, I would say Karen Kusama. I would, I would love to work with her. Um, if you were still alive, I'd love Kubrick, but I think I would just get out of his way. I don't think it would be a collaboration. Um, and I love Scorsese too. And my husband's a director, so we'll see, maybe one day. Um, but I love Karen Kusama. And I think she has, I was looking at Criterion, you know, it has a website, the Criterion Film Channel. You guys get that, right? The Criterion Film, okay. Um, Karen Kusama has, has a section and she's got her 10 favorite films. And I was like, those are all my favorite films. I want Kara Kusama to direct my movie. Um, so yeah, her. And then what I read to my children, they're getting older, so there's less reading to them. Uh, but when the quarantine first hit, we read the first three books of the Harry Potter series. And then we were like, this is, you know, we're tired of boys. And then, so we hit Hunger Games and that was great. Like we were just like reenacting it, talking about it, writing fan fiction about it. So we went through all of the Hunger Games. Um, my younger daughter loves the Divergent series. So she just went all through that. My older daughter is obsessed with anime and My Hero Academia. Are you, you guys, are your kids that way too? Like, I, it's like, Whoever figures out the, the crossover with anime and like adult culture in 10 years is going to be like a bajillionaire. Um, but that's all she does. Like she's, and I was giving her such a hard time because she reads um, graphic novels only. And I'm like, read a chapter book. You know, that's what puts the roof on your head. You know, <laughs> she's like, <laughs> no. And, um, and then she took a reading test and she's like four grade levels above her the grade level. So I was like, I guess keep reading your garbage stuff. But and she loves it. She loves it. Um, and then uh, what books am I reading? Was that the first question? Yes, your, your first horror stories. I mean, I don't know uh, when you were young, any horror novels or stories, authors, et cetera? Um, so my first, my mom used to tell stories all the time um, and they were like crazy stories and they were great. You know, they were so creative. And um, so I, I was raised on these fantastic stories and by fantastic, I mean really good, but I mean, just like out of this world, genre, fantasy, bringing things in, pulling my best friends into the stories and the Easter bunny and an adventure and time travel. And I was like four. Um, so like, I think it was her. And then um, Patricia Coombs wrote these books in the 1960s, but my town was so old fashioned. That was like what everybody read in the eighties um, called Dory the Witch. And it was a series for like, it was just uh, before chapter books. And I was obsessed with those. I love them. It was about a little girl and her mother who were witches. And uh, they were there was in a coven and they were always doing magic. And I don't know, if you have young kids, they're so beautiful and they're so cheerful. Um, and they're great. Uh, and then I read Lois Duncan and um, down to Dark Hall has had a real influence on me by Lois Duncan. I, I feel like that's a really interesting story about um, madness and being an artist. Uh, and I don't know if you know the, the premise, but it's like a, a boarding school for artists, dancers, and uh, but only women. And they get there and they all start acting funny and they're not sleeping. And they slowly, it slowly comes to pass that 
it's not a school for ballet at all. It's a school where geniuses inhabit them and they do genius work. You know, the, the, you know, Mozart came in and, and wrote another sonata um, while they were sleeping through their bodies. But within the month they go insane because the portal opens wider and wider until just any madman is, is doing whatever work he or she wants through this girl's body. It's, you know, and, and in it, there's a dark hall because they live on a dormitory, but it's also like how they become possessed. They like dream of a dark hall. It's, it's a good story, but so Lois Duncan and then Stephen King, I think I read Lois Duncan in fourth grade and then by sixth grade, I was adult books. I was Stephen King, I was John Saul, I was Dean Koontz. And then, you know, I got into Atwood and Okay, well, I wanted to ask also if you have work in a film with your husband, but you already said, um, like, no, <laughs> or something. No, we, no. Okay. it's funny, we, um, my film agent introduced us in the hopes that he would adapt and direct my first book, The Keeper, and we went on a date instead. And then we realized it was too, uh you know he was he he had like four different jobs that he was working on at the same time and he was doing his screenwriting and he was pushing his own directing stuff and I was like my book needs to come first or not at all <laughs> like you know because we were together I was like he's he's not working on this so much so um I think I didn't understand at the time what that life is and like the film industry is you're supposed to take on five projects because only one of them pays a year and then you're all you're pushing them all through at the same time but it was also like too much pressure on our relationship and it kind of came to be like well did did i want him to do this adaptation or did i want to date him you know and i think we both decided we just take the work out of the equation and then we didn't talk about it again until we moved out to LA because then, you know, I was pregnant on the honeymoon. So, you know, there was a lot of, you know, certainly weren't gonna collaborate on a project. Um, but when we got out here, um, we started collaborating on an adaptation of Audrey's Door. Um, so we've been doing that and it would be great. You know, he's got this really, really quick plot mind that I don't have. He's like, what if this happened? And then you did this and then this. And then you've got to, you know, do the big reveal at the end. I'm like, you do? <laughs> what do you have to do? You know, so it's it's fun. I'm learning a lot from him. And I think my character stuff is an asset to him, so. That sounds cool. I mean, uh, Audrey Store has a very cinematic uh, parts that I would love to see in, on a film. I, I, I also want to read some of the uh, comments on, on Facebook, Carolina Urrago says hi. Um, KNCR Camarena, could you ask her about future projects? And Christina Saez says it's a pleasure to meet her. She seems very lovely and smart and beautiful. And Alicia Chapa sends greetings. So the only question is um, about your future projects. You already uh, told us about Good Neighbors. Maybe you can tell us more about it. Um, well, so as of today, I wrote a short novel during quarantine called You Have the Prettiest Mask. And that's, um, you can look at the excerpt on Lit Hub right now, if you want, it's the first 4,000 words. And then the entire novella is at Small Beer Press in this, um, magazine called Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet, and uh, it already shipped. So if you want to order it, you can. And uh, the one thing is, it's about girls at an all private school who um, wear plague masks. And uh, it's, it's very much anti-mask. And I have to preface that with, I was writing this before lockdown. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is great. And, um, and then, uh, so it's, it's, 
it's very, you're like, she wrote this after lockdown. And no, I really did have this idea before lockdown. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm not anti-mask. And like, I think I even, when I sent it out or my agent sent it out, I was like, you gotta write a thing saying I'm not anti-mask at the front. Like wear a mask, this is not about that. But it's mostly, it's a, so it's a bunch of girls prep school, when they turn 13, they have um, a bloody 13 where, where they're given like a huge party and a mask they have to wear for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's a fun one. And I go go to LitHub if you want to look at it, because I think I think it's a good story. And then uh, Good Neighbors is coming out in February. And that's, um, it's two things. It's kind of a return to form. Um, it's like a meaty novel, uh, but it's also, it's not slasher, it's not bloody, it's not, you know, if you're looking for that, um, give this a try, please. Uh, but it's more um, psychological. Uh, if you like, if you read any Megan Abbott, um, it's darker than that, or it goes to crazier, crazier, more horror places, but, um, but it's got that same sensibility. Um, so that, and then Mom's Night Out is the book that I'm working on now. Um, and it's about, it's like a Gilead um, or, you know, like an Atwood post-American culture, but this is a company town and it's uh, a woman and her family who moved to a company town and something's off and she knows it. Um, there's something evil in the company town. And then um, I feel like I have, an, oh, I have a, a novelette that's like a 10,000 word story in Best Horror of the Year. And that's out right now too. And it's also in Hex Life, another anthology that's also out right now. And then I have a, a short story called The Changeling. Um, and there's an audio version of it and maybe a print version of it up at Tour Nightfire. Um, and that came out last month. So, and then I'm doing a TV adaptation. Well, I'm doing a lot of film projects with, of my own stuff. So at some point it would be great if any of them were made. Actually, I just read a couple of days ago uh, the, the preview. We can call it preview for the, you have the previous mask. I was so angry, like I want to keep reading. <laughs> I was like, oh, this was because I didn't know it was a preview. I thought it was a, like a oh. short story you put on the on the internet and stuff. And I was like, let's see what this is about. And then I was like, ah, it, it was the, they 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 just got my attention. So now I gotta I'm gonna have to to buy that that novel. Uh, it's but it's very kind of interesting. Like you would think they would put a link at the bottom that was like, buy it now. Because yeah. <laughs> you weren't the first person to be like, that was nice. <laughs> no, it, I mean, and I'm it, like, it got my attention and it, I, I get angry because it happened to me a few months back when uh, this Japanese author, uh, Murai, Murayami, Murakami, uh, he gave a preview, just one chapter of his upcoming two novels he published two novels together. Uh, and I was like, wow, I, now I need to know. And then I got the books and I haven't read them. <laughs> I haven't finished them, but <laughs> it's a very good thing. I mean, uh, we were talking a few years ago with uh, Caitlin R. Kiernan. And uh, she, she said like, she started back in the early 2000s or mid 2000s to do, to work with, uh, directors, movie directors, that they would make this very short, like a trailer for, for her books. <clears throat> and it actually worked very good because people thought like, oh, there's gonna be a, a, a movie about this and this, like, no, it's not a movie, it's the, the short, the, the trailer for my book. And it was, it was amazing. I don't know why not more authors do this, but it's cool. Maybe you can tell your husband, hey, you need to work on a, on a trailer for Good Neighbors. He did. He and uh, Jeremy Saulnier, who directed Blue Ruin and the other movies. Um, sorry, Jeremy, <laughs> but uh, they're good friends and they did the Audrey's Door trailer together. And that's that's on my website. But um, it's 
I don't know. I think publishers were trying it for a while, but I don't know. It's so expensive to do a trailer. I think Jeremy and JT did it for cost. They didn't, they just were like as a favor and it costs $10,000. So, you know, I think like I heard Del Toro did the trailer for The Strain. So that's probably like 50 grand. And then is the publisher getting that back? I don't know. Like, I don't know that they they were able to have that convergence of people, more people actually ordering the book because they saw the trailer. Maybe they do, I don't know. Oh, well, I'm going to read a question from Carolina Orrego. Uh, she first says, uh, she is fanta a fantastic human being, very sensitive. Could you ask her if she likes Hayao Misaya Miyazaki movies? And if so, are they an inspiration to her own? Studio Ghibli always has a strong family and characters in ordinary situations too. I had never seen Miyazaki uh, before we showed my oldest daughter, my neighbor Totoro. Um, and I love Miyazaki. I love all of those movies. I think my favorite is the one, is the depressing post-apocalyptic one where it's like the the Beatles. What's the name of that one? You know, where the... The dragonflies or... Um, maybe it's the grave of the fireflies Fireflies. that's yeah. a very sad movie very sad movie it's not the fireflies i'm not thinking about that one i'm thinking because i haven't seen that one i'm thinking about the one where it's like an army but they're really just trying to get their baby back an army of like bugs and then it's it's an environmental disaster movie and it's a Maybe it's a princess. I don't know. Anyway, I yeah, I, I love the Miyazaki movies. We took the kids to Japan a couple of years ago and wanted to go to Studio Ghibli, but apparently it's like a year long wait list to get into, but whatever. <laughs> so, but I, um, I just get weepy when I see women in charge because I never had any exposure to that growing up. And I don't, and it's very hard to figure out how to navigate the world. Princess Mononoke, that's what it is, yeah. It's very hard to figure out the world um, and a job and, and raising children, girls to be their own bosses when you don't know how yourself. And I think, you know, it's, it's a struggle and it's not intuitive and, and part of, you know, being an adult is, is my figuring out how to do things that aren't intuitive and how to do things that don't come naturally to me and make me uncomfortable. But I mean, I'm thinking about when I was little, Wonder Woman was Linda Carter and our boss was like, let me take your glasses off for a minute. He was like, you are beautiful. And like, you know, cause she had glasses on, she wasn't good. And she was like hot Linda Carter, you know? And, um, and I had a bikini that was Wonder Woman. And I took my daughters to see the newest Wonder Woman, um, the feminist Wonder Woman, and we leave. And I'm like, and I cried, like I cried in the middle of it. I was like, I want this. I want to see this all the time. I want to see my point of view. And we leave and I'm like, what did you think? And they were like, you know, why did she let that guy stick around? He wasn't her friend. He was trying to make decisions for her. We really liked Robin Wright's character who was like the Amazon warrior and they didn't relate to any. And I was like, oh, progress, you know, <laughs> they're like ages ahead of me. And I'm so glad, um, but I, I honestly think Miyazaki's ahead of me. Like I never had exposure to Miyazaki. Um, I wish I did. Yeah. What, what, now that you're talking about whipping with things, uh, I, I am, I am always whipping with movies or with books and uh, people, my friends make fun of me and stuff. I don't care. But just uh, when I was reading the part with Audrey's door where, where uh, Jean, the, the boss, loses the kid and everything goes back to normal after, after her, her uh, 
boy passes away. And then she's walking through the rooms and seeing that when, when she enters the room of, uh, I don't remember the name of the character, her, her door, other of her sons, and he's there lying in bed with his uh, boyfriend. And they are like two teenagers, very, very skinny and all. And uh, when, when everything comes back to her that she could have been there instead of uh, trying to go to work and putting a roof on, their, uh, on top of their heads and all this stuff, uh, that was really tough. I like the fact when you put, uh, when you can write a novel and yes, it has horror and whatever you want, which is something that we discuss in a group. We, we love horror, but if you can make somebody feel uh, teary enough to make them cry, uh, like, like you did with, with this book to me, it is, it is amazing. I want to tell you, that's my favorite part of the book. At some point, I, I actually told Morgan, like, I didn't like uh, Audrey anymore because she was really acting weird. I know something that ha was happening to her. And yes. I, I, again, as we said at the beginning, maybe we as men, we cannot really connect 100% with, with what a lady goes through. But I was really angry at the end. Like, what are you doing, Audrey? Like, really seriously, you are, you are just being mean now. You're just being mean. But this, this, uh, this part of the, uh, the boss's son passing away was amazing. I thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. I actually, that's my favorite part of the book too, and I think it's the part that works. Like Audrey's door, uh, I think I worked too hard on it, honestly, and I think I kind of worried it into some phrase. Um, but uh, I remember looking at it and thinking like, yeah, I could cut all of Jill and it would make more sense. And I could cut, you know, the trip to Iowa. But those are the only interest, like those are the interesting parts of that book, you know? So I, sometimes things are messy. Um, yeah, I think that that's the best part of the book too. Thanks. <laughs> oh, and speaking about um, feminism and all with the movie you saw, uh, you are, well, I read somewhere that you're a fan of Mary Shelley. Did you find oh, yeah. her like uh, late in your life or? I did, yeah. I mean, I, I read, I don't know, I probably read Frankenstein Young, but then I reread it and I was really impressed. You know, it's, it's great. It's so well done and it's uh, so unique. And I love the idea that, I mean, to me, it's a story of pride and uh, just a refusal to, to, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the Cylons hating the humans for having made them. It's the, and the, which, which is wonderful. And the humans for refusing to see that the Cylons are them. You know, it's the same story, but it's a beautiful story and it's really well done and really neat and smart and architectural in a way. Um, but honestly, my true love is Mary Wollstonecraft, her mother, and like, oh my God, she's so smart. And I, I've wanted to write a book about her for so long, like a fictionalized account, because she had these girls and she wanted to educate them and then she died and they were not educated. You know, they were just given away. And I can't imagine I mean, the injustice of that and what they, I mean, Mary Shelley's great, but what she and her sisters could have been, and, but they had no access to anything. I mean, yeah, on the rights of women or vindication on the rights of women is so ahead of its time. And it's so um, a Trojan horse because it's like, we need so much more than this, but I'm only gonna say we need this because you're not ready. Um, oh, it's, it's beautiful. I th and what's interesting is it, it holds now. You look at it and it's like, did there's still these same issues happening? And when, with, when it, was it written, like 17 something? It's been crazy. So yeah, I love her. Thank you. I don't know if Ramon wants to ask something. Well, um, actually, I enjoy very much the um, reading of uh, hindsight, this uh, short history about uh, the end of the war, 
sort of. Um, and I, 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 I think that this um, idea of uh, people and things flooding around uh, our planet like the, the rings of Saturn is a very beautiful, very poetic idea. And uh, I, I just want to thank you for reading that part of the of this story. Uh, I when I I finished to to read that short story of yours, I remember uh, the great uh, short stories of many writers uh, of science fiction, and I believe that history uh, deserves a place among the great writers of the of that genre. So, thank you very much. That's You're a, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I remember a lot of Barry Malzberg, uh, A Galaxy Called Rome, uh, a, a short story classic from the 70s, and also Connie Willis, uh, he, she wrote a, a, a short story called Daisy to the Sun uh, in the 80s. So uh, I don't know, it's, it's very special uh, found or to find uh, someone to, to have the the gods to write a, a short story like like yours, like hindsight, very, 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 I don't know, it's a tour de force, so to speak. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll say like, uh, I love taking all the credit because I love credit because this is a hard job. So when I get that, I love it. But um, I've been really lucky in that John Joseph Adams published all of anything I sent him. Um, so that's really freeing um, in that then I could write whatever I wanted and I could write to my heart. And sometimes it didn't pan out um, and I didn't write the best story, but then it gave, having that opportunity to fail is really, really helpful. Um, and Chris Golden did the same thing. He asked me for a story and I was, I wrote him, I wrote something that in my mind is kind of crappy and I, I didn't want it to be crappy. I tried to make it good, but it's, it's not great. And he published it. He didn't say a word, you know, he put it in an anthology. And then he asked me for another story and I got, and I thought, oh, he'll publish whatever I write. I could do whatever I want. So I wrote a story that I think is really good and I love, and that was because of him. And then the other thing I want to say is I've been doing a lot of publicity for uh, Good Neighbors, like even though it's not coming out for a while. And I keep saying I, um, but my agent, Stacia Decker, uh, edited the shit out of me, you know, before she even sent it out because, you know, that, that book I wrote for five years, she edited that too, didn't sell. She was like line by line. And she was, I would say 30 pages all together, every time I would hand in the manuscript, she would have written 30 pages in response of like this, this, this. Are you sure you wanna do this? Like with Audrey's door, if I had given her Audrey's door, she would have been like, Audrey sucks. Like she's too mean, this doesn't make sense. This isn't a realistic character. And I don't think that's um, contrary to the art or to my voice. I think artists really need someone to tell them hey, this doesn't make sense or do this or whatever. So she really helped. And then I sent, then Lone Lee at Simon & Schuster bought this book and she gave me these edits that were not horror edits. And I was expecting it to be like, make it scary, put some devils in it. And when somebody at Simon & Schuster tells you to put like some devils in it, you go, okay. Um, she didn't do that. She, uh, she just wanted it to be more emotionally resonant. So she had me add about 10 pages randomly of like, what are these characters thinking? And it changed the whole book, even though it was like maybe 3% to 5% of the words changed in the book. Like, I think it improved it hugely. Um, and so like, I really, I love, it makes me so happy when people like what I do. Um, but a lot of it is for any writers out there, I do have people and I've never had you know, this before, but right now I have people who help me make it better. And it's so noticeable to me. Um, 
you know, I've never really been edited. I've never had a novel edited. I would send it, you know, there'd be some notes that were like punch up the gore, you know, or whatever, but it's, it's, it's a whole different ball game and it's so helpful. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I'm really grateful and it's not, um, and I'm just getting so much help and I love it. So. Awesome. And I actually went to your website um, to see if Good Neighbors, I mean, to buy Good Neighbors. And then I realized it wasn't ready yet. <laughs> I mean, like, it was to, until next year. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was already out there because of you, like you said, you publish it so much. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you pu are publish pu publicizing, like, yeah, publicizing so much, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've been, I've never had this before. They've just been like, you know, putting it everywhere. It's like, it's gotten reviews already. It's, I'm like, wait. And like my <laughs> editor got like 10 blurbs for me. I was like, editors ask for blurbs? Get out of here, you know? <laughs> it's really helpful. Cool. I also have never seen a book trailer before. I, I watched the Audrey's Door one and I was like, hmm, I thought it was a short movie made out of the book, but right. not a, like a publicity thing. So it was interesting. <laughs> but like I, you say, they're very expensive, right? Like maybe it's not worth it to have one. I think the other problem is you might, the publisher might throw this money into it, but they don't have a ton of film connections. They're not in LA, then they're in New York. And then the people they hire might not be catching the essence of the book. You know, they might do a trailer that's, you know, doesn't capture what the book is and it goes to the wrong. Like it's really important with marketing to actually reach an audience and the correct audience. Because if it's the wrong audience, they'll, you know, if, if everybody reads Good Neighbors, but they only like slashers with like, like people eviscerated, they'll be like, God damn it, you know, and, and they'll give it one star. And that's terrible for me. So if somebody did a trailer that was like in Good Neighbors, you know, blah, like a head blows up, you know, it's going to be, it's going to blow your mind. Um, then nobody could run that trailer and they'd have paid $50,000 for it. So, yeah, and and how do you you do you feel about uh, Peter Straw or Stephen King uh, praising your books? I love it. Um, you want to come say hello? You okay? Uh, yeah, I just did it. I'm here. This this is my lady. Hello. Hola. <laughs> We're from Mexico. <laughs> Hola de Mexico. Um, I forgot the quote. Oh, Peter Straub. Um, he used to hang out at the Horror Writer Association meetings. Like he would come out and I remember sitting at a table with him and I was like, I'm at a table with Peter Straub. And he was like, what are you working on? And I was like, well, I have a, I, I, he's the nicest guy. He's so the nicest guy. So I love him. I like that he likes my work. I remember after he gave me that. Oh, can you put that on? Okay. Um, I remember that after he gave me the blurb, I saw him at a convention and I was getting lunch, but he was with a group of people. And then he kind of looked away and I was like, he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to talk to me. And he, and then I'm like sitting by myself and he came over and he was like, I was afraid that you thought I didn't want to talk to you. Would you like to join us? <laughs> like, Thanks, Peter Straub. He's wonderful. He's the nicest guy in the world. And um, and the fact that Stephen King knows I exist is a total joy to me. Um, I maybe like he knows I exist. I all I know is he wrote that tweet, and I'm so happy. Um, he's super a hero of mine, and he's got to be so busy. I I imagine he gets requests to read books. I don't know how many books are published. Everybody wants a blurb from Stephen King because it doesn't matter what genre you're in. Um, so I, when that tweet came out, I texted Paul Tremblay and I was like, when Stephen King tweeted about you, did it make you want to vomit? <laughs> and he was like, a little bit, you know? 
So uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Oh, that's true because last year, uh, Paul Tremblay, what was it? The Devil's Rock? No. Disappearance at Devil's Rock. Disappearance at Devil's Rock was, was praised by Stephen King, which I guess he understands because, again, it's horror about kids dying and it's very, very sad. And Stephen King, uh, Stephen King has grandkids now and so he probably feels like what would happen if uh, if one of these kids die, you know? So so he praised Paul Tremblay and Paul Tremblay tweeted that too. It's great. I think he I think he praised Ted Full of Ghosts too. I think he's I think he's a Paul Tremblay fan. Yeah, it was that one, I think. I think or maybe one. both. Well, we have another question from Carolina Orrego. She said, last question from me. What are you reading like right now? Well, there's more questions. Uh, pull it out. I'm reading Nothing to See Here, which is pretty good. I like it. Kevin Wilson. Um, and I just finished, oh, I have like a giant, like I'm in my bedroom. Um, Only the Good Indians, Left Hand of Darkness, and I tried the three body problem and I couldn't do it. Um, so those three, but I'm about to finish Nothing to See Here. And then I I want to read this so badly, but I like I tried the first 30 pages like 10 years ago and couldn't get into it. So I'm ready, I'm ready now. Anyway. Yeah, pretty cool one. That we read that one in another reading circle. Oh, fun. Not, not this one because I think it's more sci-fi than horror. But yes, it's pretty cool. And we have more questions from Carolina Oriago, so it wasn't the last one. <laughs> she says, uh, "Is there a character story inspired by real life situations, not necessarily hers, but some?" something she saw from the news, for example, and I and said, like, I should write about it. <laughs> um, I, you know what? I always think that way. Like, I should write about this. And as soon as I sit down to write, it becomes something bigger and, like, more about me and more my stuff. And, like, sort of I wrap it around whatever's happening in the world. So, like, I'm always thinking about global warming. I'm always hearing about sinkholes or you know the permafrost melting in the arctic and emitting anthrax that's killing the cows in siberia like there's so many crazy things that are really happening or coronavirus um that are interesting but i think i haven't had a real shock to my systems for a while and excluding the politics of the world um until we moved to los angeles and i had been living in crown heights brooklyn with my family where you know we would take the kids to school without brushing their hair and everybody's kind of laid back and hipster and i got here and we picked a, a neighborhood with a great school a great public school but attendant with that is like a pta culture and a very specific expectation on women um not men but i because i think that more money you get into the less likely the woman works and so the woman is supposed to be doing all the other stuff so my book mom's night out that i'm working on now is about that kind of culture shock where like you know a doctor moves to a neighborhood where she's expected to get along socially with people that are kind of like bonfire of the vanities social x-rays which like i have a lot of friends here that i've met but there is a lot of I was shocked. I was shocked about what I was expected, what was expected of me. And I was shocked how little I was supposed to talk about actual opinions um, as opposed to like, you know, are they reading at the right level? Are they doing this? Are they doing that? What What's the packed lunch? Is it nutritious? Um, which is like, you know, um, I love my kids, but I love my kids, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess know, every I, parent says that. 
<laughs> yes. Every parent says that in the world. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going out at 10 at night because I'm worried about their nutrition for lunch. Like, <laughs> So not, I think not like, not like the Sarah in your story that they didn't care about the the food. <laughs> oh, oh, you mean uh, Jill in in Audrey's door? No, you're talking about Ernesto. The... No, the Sarah in the in the second coming Sa story. Sa sacred. Oh, time. you know that she said that she 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 didn't give very good food to, to their son. <laughs> oh yeah, the hint side, hint side, the short story. Yeah. I'm like trying so hard to remember that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all loved it. I told Morgan like maybe like we are going to ask you questions because it happened to to Lair Baron that we, we I would ask him like hey do you remember this or that happening in that story and he was like I don't even remember that story I don't even remember what you're talking about but I, he said it's been 15 years I mean what do you want me to remember but <laughs> well i think as soon as something gets published you're like thank god that's done <laughs> you yeah. don't look at and especially i mean if it's short stories right and you have a, a bunch of them so it's it's hard to remember all of them i guess well but you know that story we were discussing it yesterday and there uh, were uh, very, very good critics about it. Uh, we were discussing a lot that story. Uh, some people really don't like it. And some people, we really like it a lot. And I was telling them that I like the, the way you uh, elaborate the horror in that story. You know, some, some uh, images like the ones, uh, the, the little boy that has all his blacks, are, all his eyes are black. I mean, some images that how you work it, how you construct it. That's why what I like about that story. Uh, we have some friends that want to ask you about about uh, Latin American uh, literature authors. If you like some, which ones? Um, you know, I love Marquez. Uh, I let me think. Octavio Paz, I've read. I liked him. I liked. There's. I wish I wish I you know I took a class on Latin American literature and I read and they they were all just so rich and so much magical realism and I could see where America had sort of borrowed all of that in 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 its 1980s and 90s and aughts um, it seems to have come from Latin America uh, there's one set in Haiti after the I don't know well. I liked them all, <laughs> but uh, Marquez uh, is the first time I've had to take notes while reading something because I was like, "Wait, who is this? And where are they?" You know, it's 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 in the tree in the opening, but you have to really you have to really work on that book. Um, Actually, I was going to ask if uh, the the ant invasion in Notre Dame had some, you know. Some inspiration from Garcia Marquez because from from uh, hundred years of solitude, you know, there's always the ants, ants, and and I was going to ask you too about have you eaten uh, ants because uh, we have a friend from Colombia and he brought us some huge ants and you eat them and then you told us a while ago that you were eating crickets, uh, grillos in Oaxaca. So I maybe find a connection between Audrey's door and. A hundred years of solid, dude. I don't know. Um, direct reference. The ants were a direct reference. Um, just sort of, you know, that that beautiful ending of the ants swallowing the generation, um, and then I've totally eaten ants, like, cause delicious, good source of protein, but also like climate change, we might have to eat some insects. <laughs> that is true. A lot of insects. And there's a lot of insects. Let's hope they don't die from pollution or something. You know, in the south part of Mexico, uh, many people eat a lot of insects. I don't know, in, in the north, not a lot. 
but in the south part of Mexico, uh, we we eat a lot of insects. Yeah, it's actually like uh, it's surprising to you in, coming from United States, but also all the north of Mexico is like that. Like when we travel to the south, and all oh, they eat insects. Like we are also surprised, <laughs> but we have tried. But many of my family haven't like that. They, they think they're gross, stuff like that. So it's not in Mexico in general that we eat books. <laughs> There's, I think, I think this is a true story. I don't think it's apocryphal, but during the Irish potato famine, uh, American, Native Americans were like, these guys are in a lot of trouble. Let's give them as much corn as we can. And they shipped over all this corn for the Irish to eat, you know, like it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot you can do with corn. And the Irish were like, what is this? And they ground it into their fields. Cause they were like, and you know, it's, it's funny, like what's considered okay to eat and what's not considered okay to eat. Like, I think in the British Isles or in Scandinavia, there was a climate change issue and uh, there was starvation and I forget which empire it was, but they lived on the water and they were invaders, but they refused to eat fish because it disgusted them. And they would feed the fish to the skinny cattle. And it was like, eat the fish, you know? <laughs> so I don't know, I think, I think bugs make a lot of sense. Yes, also in Australia, I think they eat a lot of books. Too. But well, um, let's talk about the Shirley Jackson Awards. You are in the board, right? You yeah. are one of the fun funders. Yeah, yeah. I, I forget, it's, it's probably like 15 years now. Like it's so long. Um, yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, the board, except for Joanne Cox, who's the administrator, she does a lot of work. Um, you know, we meet twice a year on Zoom or on Skype and we sort of set agendas, but eventually we're hoping that it's something that is self-generating. So the board picks, invites the jurors, the jurors know their job, the board starts rotating off and having new boards of directors on, and then there's a board of advisors that's more permanent. Um, and I think that's good for the health of the award because it'll stay fresh and it'll stay, you know, young, which is important. Um, but what it like, so I, I wound up having kids like two years after the, we founded this award. And so um, what I loved about it was I got to go to Boscone and have somebody like my husband traveled so much in the early years that either my sister-in-law would come or I would pay a babysitter to stay in my house for two days with my kids. And I would go to ReaderCon and I would be able to get out of the house. And it was really nice. So, I mean, a lot of the other board members are like, I met every, every writer and I got to know all these people and it was amazing. And I'm like, sometimes I left the house and it was so good. Um, but what I've also really cherished is the other boards of directors because they've become such good friends. And when you've known someone for 15 years, it's nice, it's really nice and it feels good. And um, I think that's so important in these jobs that we have that are so freelance and so transitory that any roots you can have because you're gonna have a career failure. It's inevitable and it's gonna last. And then you're gonna have an up and then you're gonna have a down. But if you don't have any roots to hang on to, you feel very untethered. Um, so that's been great, you know, raising kids. And like at one time, like my mom was in the hospital, my dad wasn't feeling well, I couldn't go to ReaderCon and I was making them dinner and my kids and we had a board meeting and I just had the phone propped over the, the stove while the rest of the Shirley Jackson was at ReaderCon in a hotel. And my dad was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What is that? You know, <laughs> I don't understand. Why aren't you making my dinner? And I was like, get out. I'm just like five minutes. And <laughs> so, I mean, that's been so good. It's been a life, it's been a lifesaver. Yeah. And I hope, 
other people uh, liked getting their awards. <laughs> but yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> for them. I'm glad they did, you know. And that's I cool. and I do think I I do really like that um, this specific kind of award I think is different from other horror awards in that it's uh, I think it's a it skews more literary and uh, and I really love that those those works kind of get lost. And I think it does help the winner's careers and it does connect them to the community in ways they might not have been before. Um, you know, they, they fly in from Texas and they get this award and then they're like meeting these people they wouldn't have met. And hopefully that sustains them because that's really important. Thank you. Yeah, we have a, a small contest in our group. So we hope someday it grows bigger than that. But, but it's, it's cool to listen to you about you met your friends from the war 15 years ago. We now the, the Circulo Lovecraftiano war. It's like uh, 10 years that we met. So it's, it's good to be in this. Uh, community yes environment artistic stuff because we we are not writers <laughs> most of us but some like Ramon he's a writer and Santiago and Ernesto have published uh, some things so but other uh, part of the world is like me I'm a general physician Mariana is a psychiatrist so we have very different areas but it's nice to to come together in literature and learn from from you guys and and all the activities we do is it's very um fulfilling so we feel good to have you and learn from you thank you yeah i want to say the same because uh when we started you know communicating with with north american authors uh and we started getting the feedback uh, it was very important for us because at first you say, you think like they are not going to have time to answer this interview. Sometimes the interviews were really long and stuff and and uh, you realize how you guys or it's what what John Langan told me like we want to we want the feedback. We want to know what is going on in Mexico or in Latin America. We want to know what do you think? Even if you didn't like it, I want to know. I want to know if if, if if you think my book suck, tell me. I, I, I want to know because sometimes agents won't tell you uh, or your friends won't tell you because they are too busy doing agent stuff. And uh, I want to hear it directly from the source. What, what do you guys think? And we love your work. No, I, uh, this is the fun part of the job. <laughs> This is great. I'm like, oh, you want to talk about something I wrote? Awesome. You know, and then you have questions for me about like what I'm reading. Don't you want to be asked that? That's amazing. <laughs> Do you feel like a rock star sometimes? <laughs> no. Um, no. <laughs> well, or a movie star now that you live in LA, you know. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I feel like uh, it's a really hard career and you can be feeling like you're doing good work and you can and nobody is saying that's good and uh, you can feel like you're doing good work and people are saying it's good and so um, I, I, I'm trying to enjoy it while it happens, I hope it happens for a while. I'm always gonna be working. I'm always gonna be writing. So anytime this happens, I'm like, great, great, you know. Um, but, uh, but I've been through every incarnation of this. And so I know, um, I know you can sometimes just be on the wrong end of the cultural pulse. And uh, so this is great and I'm really enjoying it. Actually, I was going to tell you that like, you sound like you picked a little bit of the Californian accent. And when, when you call your father, he doesn't tell you, hey, what's going on? Like, 
Are, are you becoming a Cali girl now? I probably am a little bit more and then I'm like a little more relaxed than I was in New York, which is good for everyone. Um, yeah, I'm calmer. Um, well, now that the election season passed, we are already all, almost in Thanksgiving. It's going to be a virtual Thanksgiving, I guess, all over the USA. Uh, but I guess you are you can relax more. They say we are going to have a vaccine by next year. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I mean, we've been really lucky with that. With you know, we've just we both work from home, so and the the hardest part is. Uh, Our kids aren't going to school. I don't know if your kids are going to school. We don't have kids yet. <laughs> um, Ernesto has I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, we, I think he's not going to school. I mean, the, his classes are in online. I. It's hard to do your work, and we're not. Our kids are doing it mostly on their own, but it's hard to police their internet activity. And it's not even like content. They're not, they're like just looking at anime or whatever. But I feel like this is what I hate the most about this. This is how much they're attached to their screens. And I get the need for it. I would rather they closed everything down but schools or um, they just called school off for the year. Like I don't pay the teachers or whatever, but I would rather they were doing something else like digging holes, you know, <laughs> whatever. Like, I just, I, I hate how much time they're on screens. And I feel, I like, feel exactly the same way, exactly the same way. It's bad for the soul, I think. So, but anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it'll get better. There's a vaccine. This, this clown might be taken out in cups. So that would be great. Usually, um, I'm the guy who is in charge of interviews uh, when when they are Q and uh, Q and A sessions uh, on, on on email, uh, and, uh, and there's a question that is going on a lot, and and, and sometimes Ramon has a, another group of science fiction, and and I ask the authors the same, like, what is going to change in literature? Like, are you going to include masks? And and you already did, you already did. It was before the lockdown, yeah. but. It, Uh, maybe maybe this was a good uh, spanking lesson for the humanity, the, the COVID thing. Like, okay, learn and don't do this again, maybe. Um, I feel like, uh, so after the big hurricane in New York um, that like blew out the, some of the subways and hit up all of Brooklyn and people were displaced in like Sheepshead Bay, uh, the mayor Bloomberg was asked, Um, are you going to build a wall around Manhattan, a seawall, and some of Brooklyn? And he said, no, because it's going to be something else next time. It's not going to be a flood. It'll be a different thing. It's always something different, and you have to be prepared for what you can't prepare for. And I thought that was so smart. And so, like, it's COVID this time. Probably be something else next time, you know. So, so our masks going to be in it. I think. I think more than anything, narrative structure might change to match our sort of disjointed coherence. And, and that's not only because there's so much happening at such a faster pace, but also because we're online all the time, we have different attention spans than we did before. Um, I don't know if you read M.T. Anderson's feed. It came out like in the 90s, but it's about a kid and they all have ports, you know, and uh, they can like go different places, you know, in their minds, but with their friends and, uh, but they get advertised to. And this one girl in the group whose father is an academic and doesn't have any money, but she's hanging out with the rich kids decides to play a joke and to uh, follow advertisers, um, that she would never normally follow and then don't have any kind of coherent pattern. So then she can't actually be advertised to, so no one can make money off of her as she's on her feed. And then she gets sick and she's at the hospital and they can't 
um, they can't treat her because her father doesn't have the money, but no advertisers will pay for it because she didn't have a coherent stream and she dies. And that's the story. And it's crazy. And the kids don't remember it happened because their lives are so fast that they're kind of high on technology. Um, and I feel like that story, if it were published next year would be a bestseller. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, mm. yeah we're living too fast for our own good. <laughs> Well, we're gonna um, stop the live transmission, but we can stay here for a while after that. We wanna say thank you to everybody who's watching on Facebook Live. Thank you, Sarah, for being with us. Thank you for thank all you. your questions. And I don't know if you have a last uh, words for your Latin American crowd. Um, I'd love to hear from you and thank you for watching. Well. Let's stop the transmission. Goodbye.